Hello, Iris. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks for, for having me. Um, yeah, Iris Lappendel. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, yeah, 35 years old already. I'm, <laughs> I'm a former professional cyclist. I'm a designer and I'm also um, the co-founder of the Cyclist Alliance, a union for uh, women cycling. I have my own um, uh, brand of uh, cycling apparel. And uh, I do also some some commentating work for Eurosport when when there's some time left. And um, yeah, I'm still riding my bike a lot, nice. just for fun. Yeah. yeah how how much do you ride at the minute? <clears throat> I have a studio in uh, Rotterdam, so I ride like every day to work, and it's like one and a half hour a day. What? And uh, <laughs> and then in weekends I do yeah, yeah. some longer rides. Oh, yeah. awesome. And full head-to-toe Iris kit, I'm imagining. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. So let's go to the beginning of your life. You know, you're a little kid. How did you get into cycling? What's the story? Uh, I, got, I got into cycling in a very typical Dutch uh, way <laughs> because I actually started speed skating. Oh, wow. uh, long track, uh, which is a, a very Dutch uh, sport. Um, I've, I, do, I did it for several years and then, um, yeah, cycling was like the, the summer training. Yeah. And at, the, at my club, they, they said like, well, Iris, maybe you should race a bit more your bike instead of <laughs> skating. As, you seem to have a bit more talent for that. And yeah, then I started racing when I was, I think, 16 or 17. Uh, which went pretty well uh, right away. Um, I was invited for world championships oh, uh, wow. as a junior, and I uh, got a bronze medal right away at the time what? trial. So then I was like, "Oh my god, I'm really good at this!" <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then and then um, the year after, I signed for the uh, UCI women's team in the Netherlands and. Since then, I've always been uh, racing. Yeah, the first few years, uh, I also did a study, and after some part I work. And from 2010, I I raced full time until 2016. Yeah. Nice. So you're quite glad you hung up the skates then. Yes, but I'm, I'm still, especially now when I'm not racing anymore, I'm, I still skate every, in winter at least, every nice. weekend if I stop, because it's like my first love and it's, I, yeah. I really enjoy that, that sport, it's, it's super nice. So. It's nice, so you mentioned there that you went on to ride professionally, full time from 2004 to 2016, what were your highlights from your, from your career? Well, I think in, in terms of results, it's been um, the, the most standard result was being a national champion in 2014. Yeah. Um, but I also uh, yeah, won the, the, the World Cup race in Sweden in 2012, I think. Um, yeah, and, and also I have like really nice memories of uh, winning Giro Rosa with, with Mariana Voss, for example. <clears throat> we did some um, in the time of uh, that I raced for the Cervelo test team. Yeah. We had like amazing victories, especially in team time trial, which was our, uh, yeah, really our strength uh, those years to have really good memories of. So I think it's... Yeah, it's it's a few those few races that I won myself are uh, like great to look back to. But in general, I think the highlight really was being you know part of the teams and working towards those goals together. And and I've definitely been part of some amazing teams. Like the Cervelo Test team for me in 2010 was there was the opportunity to become uh, like a full-time pro and, and racing with uh, Emma Pudi and uh, Sharon Laws and Lizzie Dignan. That was like really awesome. Yeah, uh, I bet your team time trial team was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it was like that team time trial was like, uh, I don't know, something I always was like, you, you were always like, 
shitting your pants knowing that you have to do this team time trial with with Emma Pooley and, and Kirsten Wild and some other like super big agents and at the same time it was so exciting because yeah you were no so for cool. sure yeah. just hope you're not behind Emma Pooley otherwise you know you're not going to get much <laughs> slipstream there <laughs> no I wasn't yeah. no. <laughs> Awesome. Well, that sounds super cool. And then you went on to raise for Rabobank, Bigler, United Healthcare. So yeah, you've had an amazing, amazing career. But I actually found out that alongside your career, you were you were pursuing another passion. Um, so tell us about your kind of you had you had your design stuff starting out whilst you were racing how did that get started how did that fit in with racing um well i i studied for uh for a product engineer um and when i finished that study i you know i really wanted to race my bike and i at that point i found out i was pretty good at it but then yeah couldn't make a living out of it and i and i also really liked being i always liked to have that distraction of doing something completely different and also be like sort of the whole yeah design world or at least the non-cycling world was so yeah oh i always liked it to 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 have um my eyes also focused on multiple things so i started uh, uh, as a freelancer and i did some projects for some companies in the bicycle industry and the first years that, that was actually more uh, in soft goods like saddle i designed saddle bags or uh, decals for wheels or like a whole bunch of things and um, and it was just like yeah now and then whenever i could find some work and um, I think it was like 2011 or 12, uh, I, I, I competed in the um, competition of the UCI for the World Cup leaders jerseys. Yes, and I yes, won that I competition. That. And then that was actually really cool because at that time, the World Cup, which is now World Tour, you had four different um, uh, categories like overall leader, young rider, uh, best climber, best sprinter. And the very first race, I was in a breakaway. It was in uh, uh, in Drenthe, I think, the, yeah. the World Cup. And I won the, the sprint jerseys because I was in a duo breakaway and I took all the sprints. <laughs> Actually, that year, I also won my own designed uh, sprint oh, wow. jersey. Well, I wasn't a sprinter at all, but... <laughs> Kind of, uh, that was kind of cool, and um, and since that point, people sort of it got some like attention, and people were like, "Oh, she's probably a jersey designer." So I got more work into in in that uh, field. In 2016, I designed the uh, the kit for the Dutch uh, Olympic team. Amazing. Uh, the cycling team, and um, yeah, and that was also my last year that I raced. So. Um, I guess I guess it's sort of I always like to to have yeah multiple things. I never felt comfortable like being only focused on cycling. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So do you feel like in do you say 2012 when you won that competition was that the kind of was that when the idea of maybe Iris started that you could start designing cycling kit or had that always been something you wanted to do? No, actually when I finished my studies, I, I really wanted to do something completely different out of cycling. What did like you want to do? Designing furniture yeah. or you know, like really different stuff. And uh, and actually, it was only the last maybe two years, like 2015 and 16, that I started thinking of uh, using my, uh, yeah, also my network in cycling and do something uh, with, with cycling apparel. And and really it i think it came it was because of the like the positive response i had on those few projects i did and then when i retired i was like oh wh what am i going to wear now like i <laughs> definitely don't want to wear all this all this logo branded cycling apparel so i need something cool and i just yeah of course i i i was i 
has, has have always been focused on it so i knew there wasn't like that much nice stuff out there and not just how it looks but also like the fit like also as a as a cyclist it was always a struggle to to have like really good kit mm. like i i i just don't remember how many times have i've been um amending my own kit in all those years like making taking elastics out or putting elastics in or making sh sleeves longer or shorter or changing the whole chamois in the pants from taking yeah. them out of other pants putting them into my new pants like <laughs> i've done so much of uh, like trying to optimizing like making my my wind vests more uh uh fitted and yeah Oh, honestly, some of the kit you get, you know, often when you're, or at least in my experience, riding for smaller women's teams, it would just be small men's kit. And then obviously you have to kind of pin it yeah. and try and make it, make it different. But since, I mean, there's definitely much more uh, women's kit available now that, that fits. And I think Iris has definitely been part of that. Um, and for those who don't know, I would definitely recommend going and checking it out. The designs are like super bold and colourful and they just, I, I think that you, you would be quite happy rocking around in, in one of those. So going into more the, the start of Iris, once you'd finished your career, did you find it difficult into, you know, transitioning from okay i'm a full-time professional cyclist to now i'm a business woman <laughs> yeah that, that was that was really difficult uh and it was also super exciting and it was also really scary mm. uh because on one like so first of all there is the part of not being a professional athlete anymore so i although i I knew already the last year that I was racing, like probably it's going to be my last year. Also, although I didn't really make a, make a decision until my very last race, but I was very much looking forward, like not being a professional athlete anymore, yeah. like not being, not having to bother about like my fitness, my health, my traveling, you know, like you're so self-centered when you're, a, when you're an athlete mm. and I was very tired of that but at the same time so then I, I, I remember then you wake up and you're like okay uh, a big kind of a big transition and then I also right away decided to start my own brand so it was good because I had something to focus on and something to really like um yeah as we say in the netherlands we like to put our teeth into and, yeah. and um, <laughs> work on that project at the same time we were also setting up the cyclist alliance and i also started um uh they asked me to do like a world speed record attempt from a dutch university in one of these recumbent what? bikes <laughs> so uh, Actually, I had like a super full program, um, and I guess that's also like yeah. When you re when you when I was thinking about retiring and when I took the decision, I was like, oh maybe I have nothing to do or maybe yeah. I have no income or I, it was so scary that I just said yes to everything that came on my path. Um, but you know, in the end, I I also really fought, especially with uh, with setting up the brand. Um, I thought like, well, I I just, this is something I really believe in and I want to give it a try and mm. I'm just going to work really hard to get it done. And when it's, when it doesn't work out, then okay, I, I've at least tried it. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, I guess that's, cool. that's something I really learned of cycling. Like it's a bit like attacking, you know, if you <laughs> never attack, you never know if it's going to work out. So, and, and what's the worst thing that can happen that you don't win yeah so it's not the end of the world yeah <laughs> so yeah. it's this uh yeah i guess that this has really been um a good uh yeah a good 
a good foundation or something, I guess, too. Right, you're going to have to tell me about the land speed record. What what, what was the story behind that? <laughs> yeah, so there, there's a, it's funny, actually, because every year in the, in the US, there is this land speed record thing, and... Um, a bunch of it's mostly university teams actually uh, participate in it, and in the in the Netherlands uh, there is this this uh, technical university. They build a recumbent bike like totally fitted to the person that's gonna do the um, record attempt, and they try to make it as aerodynamic as possible, oh of course. Goodness. And then uh, because the attempt is in uh, Nevada desert. So it's on altitude and, and the road has like a little, little bit sloped down uh, and it's an eight kilometer straight road oh and gosh. you and everyone has like several attempts in one week, try to break the, the speed, re- speed record. But then there's all these things like uh, the, the strength of the wind and like there's so many uh, variables, uh, variations that yeah. make that that make it um, if, if the if the run is legal or not okay. so uh, but it, but it was just a, like a cool experience especially so to see you those in, were you in the recumbent bike yeah so <laughs> you're in like a shell it's like yeah. you know uh, there is like no window there's a like a camera on top and you have like a screen inside oh so God. you watch the screen <laughs> It's like super scary. Like, how, do you, how yeah. do you know which way? Like, you're are you behind a car or like does it know where? No. To, do you steer? Like, how does that yeah, work? Yeah, you, you steer, uh, and that's actually the difficult thing because you steer, but you and the, the the road is more or less straight. Yeah. But of course, a little bit of wind because you go like a hundred k's an hour. So a little bit of wind, and you're like two <laughs> meters to the other way to the other side of the oh road. Oh my so god. It's, it's been, it feels like if you're, yeah, it, it feels a bit like down, going, descending on your race bike, like a super, super stiff race bike. And one, you know, if you, if there's like a little stone on the road, you go like, whoop, and that's oh exactly God. what happened. With, uh, so it feels like, yeah, like in a, that you're cycling in a rocket or something. Oh my <laughs> God. That must have been so scary. <laughs> Yeah, actually, it was quite scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how fast yeah. did you end up going? Going uh, 116 k's an hour. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> but the record actually is 100. Uh, currently, it's 125, I think. At that oh, point, wow. it was 121. So wow. uh, I didn't break it. Yeah. So you're going on this 8k road do you do like a sprint or is it like um a consistent effort yeah so you have like a six and a half or seven k like run into the sprint and then they they uh time you between i think it's a 500 meter uh stretch so yes it's sort of getting the bike up to speed and then time your sprint at this at the right moment which I found really impossible in such a uh, <laughs> in such a bike, so I think that's where it also went wrong because it's really hard to time if you're there's like these signs on the road, but yeah. if you go 100 k's an hour and you look on a on a screen, it's like impossible to see like oh two k's to go, let's speed up. <laughs> it's, not, it's more like wow. <laughs> oh my god! Well, you no. did have the women's world cup sprint jersey so i think you're probably the best <laughs> the best person for the job <laughs> yeah oh amazing anyway, it was a it was a cool experience and it was a good way to at least like keep keep my body going for another year yeah <laughs> oh my god I, I, yeah but i don't how did you even get involved with that was it was yeah they just asked me they yeah. asked me to uh, uh to participate this yeah it's like a, a team of, of students and they're all uh, they're all taking a year off their studies to work on this project so oh, they're wow. working on it full time did you and, have like uh, a radio were they like come on Iris go fast <laughs> yeah so that was actually the point but it never worked that whole week so oh, oh no. <laughs> the most simple aspect of the whole uh, of the whole project didn't work and I think that was 
Well, 116 kilometers an hour. That is impressive. <laughs> On a flat road, uh, yeah. Flat road. Down, yeah. Hey, hey, well, you know, you're used to flat roads in Holland, so. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Wow. So you, you mentioned a bit about how you kind of, you finished your pro career and you just threw yourself into all these exciting things. When did you know that your time was done with professional racing? How did you decide? I think, yeah, like I said, I always had this sort of, you know, there's a lot of athletes or that are just so focused on cycling, they're not so connected anymore to, maybe they don't have so many other, like, hobbies or passions or interests mm -hmm. anymore, and I always had that, so I think I always knew, like, oh, when I'm, when I, when I stop cycling, there, there are all, all these other things that I would love to do, and especially the last year in, in 2016, uh, I really felt like, I, I was racing that year with United Healthcare in the States and I think it's the best best move I've done in my career because it's been the most fun team and I, I really had an amazing year there and, and also still I, I was racing uh, on, on, a, on a good level but, um, but I also felt that I was more and more, it was just more and more difficult to really make that, uh, you know, to push myself every day to... Mm. to get the best out of myself and especially with races I noticed like I was not like training was no problem but I was not always that excited to race anymore and and you also are so aware of w what you can and what you can do after so many years like the first few years you're you're on the start line of Flash Wallone and you think like oh maybe I can win this race <laughs> but yeah. yeah after a few years you know like oh Flash yeah you know then there's the the Muro uh, and then I can just pedal, <laughs> pedal back to the bus. So it's like you, you, you're so, you know so well what you can and what you can do. And I think that sort of, yeah, took out that, like I think the real, the real drive that you need to be mm. a, a, a top uh, athlete or cyclist. So I just thought I, I try to, I wanna end on a, on, on a high on a good level and yeah, uh, uh, yeah I never I, <clears throat> I knew that already from early on I never want to be that cyclist cyclist that just keep riding because it doesn't know what else to do so yeah I had my last race and then uh, of the season and then after that race I thought yeah I'll, I told my team this is my last race and yeah yeah, yeah I'm gonna retire yeah, so, you're like, uh, I need to go 116 kilometers an hour in a recumbent <laughs> bike. I just need to do it. <laughs> that was definitely not my fault at that point. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, but... So another thing you threw yourself into, which we kind of touched upon, is the Cycling Alliance. Do you want to kind of explain what the Cycling Alliance is and what it does for, for the riders, for those who don't know? Yeah, so the Cyclist Alliance is an independent union for female cyclists. So we have um, members from all over the world, mostly road cycling, but also di other disciplines. So we're open to, to all disciplines and everyone from uh, 16 years on with a racing license can can join us. And what we, uh, what we basically do is like, provide support to a professional cyclist and cyclist and that's like the whole package so every kind of support they need we try to uh, provide that um, during their careers but also after their careers and I think that that's really been the most um, when we started this that's something I had a very strong feeling that something that's missing in cycling that I also yeah, realize myself when I when when I raced that there is like there need to be that 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 um, organization or that person or whatever it is that you can just always go to when you have a question, when you have a problem, when you don't know what to do, but also just basically to inform you in advance, you know, um, and educate uh, and. and educate you on like what it is to be a professional cyclist and what your rights and and duties are and um yeah and so that's we started with 
sending out a big, big survey in 2017 uh, and the, the response was really huge. Like the, we felt, we, we saw there was a big appetite for riders mm. to have such an organization and uh, together with Carmen Small and Gracie Elvin, we then, uh, we then founded the Cyclist Alliance. <clears throat> and um, yeah, currently we have 140 members. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we grow quite a quite a lot in the past four years. But yeah, basically, it's it's like a, an independent union striving. We, we we our tagline is like striving for fairness. So mm. creating a, a better place for uh, for female cyclists. Yeah, definitely. I I remember actually in twenty seventeen being one of the first people to fill out the survey and. Um, for me, I was kind of coming away from racing at that time, but I think, you know, it's it's so important that there's a kind of independent force pushing for for what the riders want and what the riders need. Um, yeah. I think, for example, with with the men's side of the sport, they have what's it called? They do have something similar, and I think, you know, it is important that the UCI is held accountable and, you know things that you know because if you're having a problem with your team or or something like that it feels like you know are the UCI going to listen to me who do I speak to um, I think I think also for a lot of writers it's a very big step to go to the UCI like mm. the, the, it's for them it's like this institution institution somewhere in in Agla and and it is actually a little bit like that like I mean the UCI uh, staff is really helpful, but by the time they answer your email, probably your problem is so much bigger or it's mm. already solved itself. Like it's, it's, it's a big organization. And I think, yeah, what you want as a writer is to be able to, you know, text me or text one of the others or email us and say like, Hey, this is my, this is my question right now. Can you help me? And then, you know, it's we always try to help riders within within a day, and and of course some 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 things take multiple days. Like when it comes to like contract advice or uh, legal support, and and some projects even took like a whole year when we went into arbitration uh, for a rider, for example. But I guess the the, the um, for a rider it's important that they know that you know we are truly independent like the uci is not an independent organization the the your federation is not always independent like do you really know that they have the best interest of the cyclist at heart and i think that's that's something at least i hope they believe uh, we have because that's mm. That's what we have. Yeah. So you were actually part of the UCI Athlete Commission, is that right? Um, yeah. In 2015 to 2017. And then in 2017, you started off the Cyclist Alliance. So did you feel like the Athlete Commission wasn't doing enough? Well, I think the just the... the, the the power, so to use that word, of the Athletes Commission is r really limited. So it's an elected commission, which is great. But then I think in those three years I was in the commission, we had only one meeting. Uh, and, and in that what? meeting, it's like you discuss any, any issues or something. It's more, you know, the UCI informing us on what the UCI does. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, when you're in that commission, you also are in your own dedicated discipline commission. So I was representing uh, road cycling in the road commission, which is one of the most important commissions. So at least I felt like I could add a value to uh, such a commission when it comes to uh, regulations or especially race calendar. So yes, I think it's um, the athletes commission itself is it's a good initiative, but like I say, the power is like very limited. And then, um, and yes, what I did realize that when I was in that athletes commission, writers actually came to me with their problems or questions. Mm. And even for me being in the UCI commission, it was really hard to help them with support of the UCI. So I felt like, yeah, these athlete, this athletes commission is, yeah, it, it's just not enough. And there needs yeah. to be way more uh, 
independent and also a way more fast and direct way to to support riders yes. and yeah that that is one of the reasons why we started the cyclist alliance yeah it's i mean it's it's an amazing organization and you know it's it's only going to go from strength to strength like you said it's grown so much in the in the last four years and i think it's 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 super important for all the riders to feel like there's someone they can go to yeah if i can say one more thing it's not just somewhere they can go to when they are in trouble but it's also um or when they have a question but i think it's also really important to realize when you have a united voice mm. if you have a seat at a table or not like with the more you are the stronger that voice is and, and we if we can keep replicating you know our mission and what needs to change in women's cycling you know the the, the stronger the, the bigger the message the, the more will happen so i think it's also the whole idea of joining a, a movement as i see it more as a movement maybe than than a union is uh, is to be part of that and to have that voice together so i think and and i'm super happy that we have like really high profile riders also part of the cyclist alliance that have never asked or help for anything but they understand the importance of a united voice mm. so just to kind of clue people in who, who maybe don't know that much about the Cycling Alliance, what are the kind of things that you've been able to change since since the Cycling Alliance started? So I think um, the first few years we've been very much... Um, so I think an important thing of what we do is surveying riders. And the results of the survey have really shown the world, but also the UCI, what's the actual what's the actual landscape and situation of women cycling. And um, and we've uh, presented that to, I have also been part of the Women's World Tour Committee. And with these results, we've been really able to push for, uh, for example, minimum salaries at World Tour level, maternity leave, improved insurance standards, an improved ethics code which were really the most, because the working conditions and minimum salary are like, really really important and that is something that's really lacking and i think it's pretty okay now for world two teams and i can i yeah i think the cyclist alliance can take credit for that for pushing for it but also showing the actual uh, uh situation but also really think in solutions uh, and not just not just uh, complaining about what's missing, but also thinking like, how can we change it? Mm. Um, so that, that's really important. Currently, we're very much pushing to have also this change on continental level, because I think, uh, especially at the UCI, there's a lot of focus on World Tour teams, but, um, uh, you know, to have like a healthy landscape of, for your, for your sport, the, the continental level is super important. And uh, now we only see that there's becoming like a bigger disparity between World Tour and Continental. Not, not, not only in salaries, but also in like level of professionalism of teams, uh, uh, working conditions, like all those, all those things that are uh, important. Um, and then we had also some projects like uh, with mountain biking. We've we've uh, been pushing for um, uh, the, the the UCI points that was like last year with the with the COVID. They it was so hard for mountain bikers to come from all across the world to a race to to gain UCI points, which were really important for Olympics. Mm. So uh, that that's been very disadvantaged uh, in a that's been a big disadvantage for riders from other continents, for example. Um, <clears throat> um, we've also been like last year been very uh, active in uh, with the whole uh, COVID like protocols. We've been checking all races in advance with uh, with uh, some uh, doctors, also team doctors, if a race is um, is it if it's safe to go to a race because. Also around these whole protocols, we've provided a lot of input to the UCI, but then you can also say that um, it's it's all been quite fake still, and there's a lot of responsible 
responsibility on the teams itself and also um, there's not been a lot of like checks if a race actually is safe so for example mm -hmm. the very first race in Spain uh, yeah we got messages from riders in the hotel they were like oh we're all in one floor uh, uh, there's teams here that <clears throat> that didn't took their PCR test in in advance like there was so much uncertainty that we just like called out to all riders like hey be aware this is this is just a very unsafe situation mm -hmm. and even not being um, um, a direct um, say direct directly involved with the UCI by sending out these messages to riders supported by riders it 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 changed things because you know the teams that weren't uh, tested couldn't race mm. unfortunately for those teams but i mean it's also you know you want to have like a very it is a such this whole covid thing is such a um is such a it is really dangerous for athletes you know if you if you the 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 complications can be can be really big if you if you get it so Anyway, I'm I'm totally <laughs> lost my track, but yeah, I think what you what in general what you could say like ex externally we've been pushing for these changes when it comes to uh, minimum working conditions, and we've been quite successful actually pushing for the, that change, but also advocating for things. Um, the Me Too movement has also been a big one. Like we had some. Um, cases of sexual harassment in the past few years mm -hmm. the whole system of the ethics committee with the uci works i don't know if it works but at least it works really really slow and it's been really difficult for riders to file a complaint when they're in a case of uh, um, uh, har harassment or abuse or whatever so uh, we've been. Uh, I think we've we've done a very good job in addressing that, but also helping riders to file a complaint eventually successfully, which you know gives is is also a sign to other riders that they don't have to put up with this mm. if it happens to them. So it's I guess it's also opening the conversation and taking the taboo out of it. You know, the ultimate aim is also to really change the culture within women's cycling because, or maybe in cycling in general, because this is not just for women's cycling, but, you know, in general, there is always this imbalance of power, which makes a, an athlete very vulnerable. And if you look internally, uh, what we've done is we've just grown our organization. Um, this year, we have a dedicated ethics officer. So she helps every rider that comes with complain. Um, on on whatever ethics topic it is and um, guide her through the process of going to the UCI ethics commission or going to uh, the Olympic committee of their country or the police even you know so I think that's been really important um, and otherwise yeah we have um, we have a legal advisor who helps with contracts um, or other issues or mediate between riders and teams uh, we have educational resources and also other uh, people who help that with that, and that's including uh, taxation, visas, insurance, contracts, salary, guidance. Uh, it's also something we're building. Um, we have an independent medical, uh, like a doctor who helps, uh, nutritional support. Um, we have something that's really cool is... Um, we provide every every member with a baseline concussion test, so they can mm. uh, uh, do this. Uh, it, it's it's from HeadSmart, an Australian company. Uh, we have a mentorship program. We have like a private communication platform for riders, and um, yeah, what else? <laughs> I guess it's more or less it. Yeah, I, I think we try. It's it's a growing package, but yeah. we really try to provide. Um, yeah, like a full package of support. Is there anything that, you know, the general public can do to support the Cycling Alliance? Yes. So we also have like a supporter membership. Uh, if you go to our website, cyclistalliance.org, there is like, a, you can join us as a supporter for 35 or uh, euro a year, or you can 
even like adopt a rider uh, for 60 euros a year um, because we ask like um, a membership fee to our riders from of 50 euro and that's basically to cover for example these legal costs etc um but it's you know for a rider that has no income it's still a lot of money so we have this we use the the supporter membership and especially the like sponsor a rider membership to provide memberships to riders that are not able to afford uh their membership so <clears throat> and then we keep you up to date on the work we're doing and you get like a cool uh tca cap and uh nice. and i think it's also just that's like actively supporting the, the cyclist alliance but in general i would say like like follow women cycling follow the riders watch it whenever it's on tv like just be engaged in the sport because it's 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 really a great sport and it's uh and it's uh and it's only getting better and more exciting so no definitely um i'd be interested to know like your opinion on how women's cycling has changed and evolved since you know you started back in 2004 to now oh yeah i mean so much has changed uh, in general i think it has become a lot more interesting um like the the the, the field has just grown the level in, in in the depth of the field has has grown and uh, i think that makes it that that's for me the biggest difference like when i started racing there was every race you could say like oh there's maybe one two or three riders that could win and now very often yeah okay maybe there's every every year there's like a dominant rider maybe but in general like the the field is uh, there's so much more depth in the field and there's more strong teams and also the the level of professionalism at the top has grown like there's uh, teams are organized way better the equipment is better there's you know those top riders have a much more professional life as uh, as it was like uh, yeah 15 or 20 years ago when there was just one or two or three riders in in, in and maybe 10 at world level that that were actually having a, a career out of cycling um so yeah i think that that's something that you that i see there's a lot of a lot of difference um yeah, yeah I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean when it comes to racing i think that time like 2004 2005 there were a lot of races actually so uh, unfortunately unfortunately we lost a few of those really great races but um they also came other races back so yeah for me that that's a bit but that's a bit the same but i think it's it's good that you see that uh, some of for example what flanders classics does with almost all, all their races now have a women's uh, race as well they're all televised yeah, that, that's great. And I think also a race like, like over women's tour for me is an example of like how to properly run a women's race with um, a dedicated media around it with, um, with yeah, you know, that, those are the kind of races that really, um, yeah, raise the bar, I would say, in, in women's cycling. So do you think the future for women's racing is better to have more standalone events like the, the Women's Tour of Britain? Or, you know, is it is it good to have, you know, a women's Roubaix attached to, to the men's Roubaix? Yeah, I think that it should be a combination of things. Uh, I, I, I can say one... one uh, one solution is better than the other. Uh, I think women's cycling has definitely benefited from being um, attached to a men's race. Not always, but in, in, in some instances for sure. Um, if it was only to make the sport more understandable or recognizable for, for fans, like if you can say to to people like yeah i'm also racing paris roubaix they're like oh wow that's amazing that yeah. you know that that's a women's race because it's a race that speaks to their imagination maybe more than the over women's tour but at the same time it's those races like the over women's tour that have like 
like an om almost perfectly organized uh, race um, with highlights on national TV. Like, oh, they're just lacking the live coverage right now. Yeah. But uh, I mean, as a rider, you really felt the racing there that you were, you were not just like a side program, but you're yeah. the main program. And I think that's also really important. So, um, yeah, I think it could be a combination of both. Yeah, definitely. And um, just on, you know, you, you mentioned that a few of the races were lost. I know that there used to be a women's Tour de France that now is no longer here. And I think that often, you know, the Tour de France comes up as a big topic for conversation because it is the most known cycling event. Um, what are your feelings on a women's Tour de France um, and kind of the future of what women's racing will look like? Yeah, I find it always a tricky question because in general, I'm not a big fan of the Tour de France or the idea of a women's Tour de France because I think, you know, if you look to the the, the financial or the, the economics of men's cycling, that's completely depending on a Tour de France. And I think that's a very unhealthy situation. Mm -hmm. So why would you want to have that same situation for women's cycling? Yeah, on the other hand, you, you're right, like it's the most iconic race and it can really lift a sport if there would be a women's Tour de France. But on the other hand, I think it's way more important to to actually use women cycling to create a sport in the right way, like mm -hmm. with a healthy economic um, um, environment and uh, where also teams benefit from the success of, of a sport, which is maybe really difficult at this point, but hopefully in the future. But you know that 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 then you need also like a, a real vision and race organizers who understand it and who want to create like this interesting calendar altogether. Because I think there is really the key: creating an interesting calendar from the beginning of the season until the end, with I don't know world championships or any other race as a as a sort of a, you know all those races leading up to it, like you see and like you see that other sports have. And I think now, actually, with the plans of uh, Tour de France for women in 2022, which is only five or six days after the Tour de France, that could be a good thing because that could be like uh, a good addition to the women's calendar, and it, you know, it could um, it could provide that. Mo you know that showcase of of women's sport with very interesting and um, race for fans, and I think that's really the key. Look, like look at what fans want to see and uh, how you can bring the sport more to the to the fans. Like in the beginning, we talked a bit about that vicious circle that mm. women cycling is in, and everyone is always like, yeah, when it's not on TV, it's not interesting for sponsors, and when it's not interesting for sponsors then you know at the end nothing really changes but if you can create like a really interesting calendar with with interesting races that fans understand that they uh, know who are the main characters in the sport that they get education on like how the uh, how the uh, how the sport works and how the game of cycling works I think Maybe cyclocross is a very good example because it's a very short and snappy and sport and you see every week more or less the same people battling for victory. And, um, you know, even though it's a very small sport, you see that it like now it's on TV every week, like that you can more or less watch it at the same times. Like there is a, uh, like Formula One or any other sport, there's like a, a rhythm in there. And I think that, you see that the viewing fi figures for, for cyclocross, especially women's racing, are like going through the roof. So, yeah, I think that's way more the key, not just to focus on a women's Tour de France or a women's Paris-Roubaix, but look like how can we create like an attractive calendar for, for teams, for riders, for race organizers, and especially for fans throughout the whole year. Uh, 
I know, that would be my dream. People forget about the fans and that, you know, cycling is entertainment and, you know, as, as much as the sport is super traditional and, you know, there's a lot of people who feel strongly that it should stick to that tradition, actually by introducing new kind of flares, different ways of, of, of kind of doing the race, it can make it even more exciting and even better for the fans, which then grows the sport and gets more people, more people yeah. involved overall. Um, I think, you know, for example, just looking a little bit outside of road cycling, something like Red Hook Crit, where they took the style of Formula, Formula One racing and combined that with crit racing, that was a new way of looking at cycling. And although I don't think that, you know, racing the Tour de France on fixed gear bikes is what should happen. Um, I think reinventing, you know, the format of, of how you do the racing. I mean, you know, for example, I know that they've tried in the Tour de France doing like preems for time bonuses at different points. And I, I feel like just taking a fresh look at what the sport could be um, is definitely a way to to get more people involved and you know more fans means more money for the sport means more people wanting to sponsor it and you know the whole thing gets improved yeah yeah no i, I totally agree with you and i think yeah like i said i think that if we need more people with that kind of vision to mm. to 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 lead the way and um, and i think I wouldn't say that that ASO or UCI are, you know, in general, uh, uh, people that that are lacking vision. But maybe you know we hold all together a bit too strongly to the to the to the current situation. And I think, uh, yeah, I think I I love watching Tour de France, but I also always fall asleep, you know, on like most of the stages. Yeah. Um, and and I and I know that. You know, also the, the the age of fans who are watching to the front is like they're they're only getting older. So we need mm. to. I mean, you're maybe a good example of a way how to connect with like young younger people. And I think they have who are interested in the sport. And I think there is, you know, we need to make we need we need to make that um, that um, a connect, uh, yeah that step also. Yeah, like, you know, for example, like the last stage of the tour this year, they had the time trial. I was saying, you know, wouldn't it be cool if they did almost like, a, a, you know, set everyone off so that they were the time behind the rider in the g general classification? Like, I think that that just just thinking about it in a way that makes it more exciting for fans, um, you know, and I think because women's cycling is a newer sport, potentially it has more flexibility in what the next races will be, um, which I think is, is an advantage um, for, yeah. for women's cycling over men's cycling. You know, potentially we have more choice in the way that the sport can go forward, um, which I think is super exciting. And, you know, I don't get me wrong, I love the fact that 2020 was meant to be the first women's Paris-Roubaix, um, which obviously due to COVID got cancelled, but I think... You know, I, I'm just excited to see the next couple of years how it unravels. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's also really great that a lot of the female, like a lot of the writers, they understand that there's also, you know, there there is this maybe this feeling of camaraderie that they all understand. It's also up to them to make the sport more popular, and they're also willing to make this effort. And I think they're probably in general way much forward thinking than than all those people in charge you know <laughs> so uh yeah that should also be like yeah that that's maybe the frustration we also have as the cyclist alliance and like come on listen to <laughs> listen to us or listen to the riders because they have so many great ideas mm -hmm. and they want to make this effort as well mm -hmm. so um yeah i think that's uh, uh yeah Let's not always stick to what we have right now, although it's nice. Like I think there is just so much opportunity in, in women's cycling. And it's a bit like when we started the Cyclist Alliance, we said, okay, women's cycling is just like a blank page. We can mm. go everywhere we want yeah. when we have a vision. And I still really, really believe in that. And 
and um, yeah, and I mean, we're we're still going for that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. good on you. Well, what what's next then? What do you think? What would you like to see um, in the coming years for for the women's side of the sport? Well, f- you know, from from on that topic, I, I would really like to see a more interesting calendar and. Uh, I mean, the races now are interested, but I think it can be just way much more aligned, and um, and with yeah, you know, more um, uh, more um, innovation mm. at the races, and hopefully that will lead to um, more uh, more women cycling on TV or any other channel. And I think we. We shouldn't be afraid to innovate and also work together with uh, with digital platforms to see, like you know, what is it what the fa- what the fans want and mm. how can we create something like that. So I think that's definitely where where the future of of uh, women cycling is. And, and for the riders, I just and that's something we keep pu- pushing for that you know these. Visibility will also improve the economic situation of the riders, so it yeah. goes hand in hand. But yeah. we will keep addressing the problems that there are right now. We we will keep helping riders and trying to uh, develop and 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 make our support platform only bigger. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's definitely all going in in the right direction. So we've not really touched much upon. Um, Iris and you know your work work with them now so I'd like to just kind of finish finish out with you telling us all about your day-to-day what you're up to at the minute designing the new collection and that sort of thing yeah yeah um and and actually I maybe maybe it's only this year that I realized that it's uh that that it's all quite connected connected because you know I also started uh, it is the brand because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to improve maybe the situation of just, you know, regular uh, women who write for fun and uh, um, regular women is probably not the right way to say it, but, you know, just normal people like yeah. uh, you and I and, um, and create something for them that, you know, will make their experience on the bike more fun. And, yeah, and, and that's what, what I'm doing day to day. So I'm I'm running the brand, yeah, with with a bit of help from from uh, some some uh, ladies at the moment, which is which is great. They help me like with uh, some marketing things and packaging, but mostly it's it's me. I'm just like currently designing the collection for next winter. Um, and that's just, uh, yeah, it's just go in my cave for two weeks and draw, draw, draw. And then, yeah, I go with all my designs to my uh, manufacturer in, in Italy. And then we, we uh, develop the styles and we get the samples. And then, you know, I, I test everything myself. That's why I have to write to work yeah, every yeah, day. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, yeah and then finally there's a there's a new collection and I think it's just really cool to keep uh, to keep pushing myself uh, creating new things and uh, not just new designs but also improving the kit and I mean there's also a lot of innovation in when it comes to fabrics and um, uh, materials so that that's super exciting a common thread with with our chat is is you know this kind of innovation and pushing for being better and you know that's something that a lot of cyclists they have this kind of feeling to you know you race a bike and you train to to become better um and i think i can definitely see that that's something you've done once you've come outside of the sport with the cycling alliance and also within your own brand um iris which is super cool by the way um (laughs) so i i think that you know, I, I, I definitely ad- admire that trait and I think that a lot of people will will be inspired by this chat and just, you know, hearing how you've managed to juggle all these all these things and 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 have a, a very exciting and interesting career so far. But also, you know, I'm excited to see what's next. <laughs> well, there's, there's, a, there's a new uh, there's a new collection. 
collection coming in uh, in March. So yeah. I'm also excited to show that. And I and yeah, I mean it's uh, yeah, it, it's like you say. It's I, I find it also really inspiring actually. Um, now I stepped a little bit more away from from the sport as a racer, and I get in touch with yeah, my customers of me like. Uh, women who work in completely different fields or they just like last summer there are so many women who started riding their bikes and they come by in my little shop in Rotterdam and they buy a new <laughs> kit and they tell me like how they get into cycling and what they love about it and I think that's and also like on social media the feedback you get and um, yeah I think that that's all super um, that, that's I really love that it's it's for me it's really uh, uh, a confirmation of uh, yeah that, that that I'm on the on the right track also with uh, <laughs> with the, with Iris the brand and uh, maybe from the beginning I wanted to create something that you know make make them also stand out a little bit more yeah because I think that just like you said like you said earlier that you know you can use like there's so many in the cycling industry in general it's just so like i i have no problem with men at all but it's just like the cycling in industry is so dominated by men and, and even when it comes to apparel for women it's mostly done by by men and i just can't yeah. believe it by, uh, <laughs> and, and i think also one of my advantages that i'm just doing this like on such a small scale is that I don't have to be again, like I started either still, I don't have to be afraid if something fails or not. So I, I feel much more, I can be much more bold and confident to try things and do exactly what I think is cool. And, you know, hopefully more people like it, but if they don't, then, you know, it's not the end of the world or we'll make something else. So, um, yeah really trying to create something that I think would be really cool I think is yeah helping me to make things that are a little bit different than like yeah. mainstream brands would do do you think you'll ever go back to maybe you know you said you wanted to design furniture is there going to be iris furniture down, down the line <laughs> Well, thank you so, so much for, for joining me, for chatting through your life and everything you've done. I mean, it's a big, long list, to be honest. Um, yeah. So thank you. If people want to find out about you, where do they go? Um, well, they, the best is they can go to my, my website. It's uh, I, uh, how do you call it? I don't know how Aww. to spell it. <laughs> iris.cc but there's like a thing in the middle or just google either sloppendale uh clothing or something yeah <laughs> or go to, to either sloppendale.com but my personal website is a bit like i think crashed so <laughs> <laughs> i'll send people to to your website in the description so uh don't worry about yeah. the spelling or anything i'll i'll put it down below so people can find I'll you follow Instagram or something and yeah. for the cyclist alliance yeah go to cyclistalliance.org that's the website awesome thanks so much yeah you're welcome <laughs> if you enjoyed this video be sure to like and subscribe and to listen to the full podcast you can search the Kira McVitie podcast in your favorite podcast platform or you can click the link below keep risking it for a biscuit and I'll see you in the next video